Hello everybody, I'm Skip Alzheimer. Welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show, where we watch old 16mm films and think better about ourselves. Um, that was some home movies from the Utz family. Not the Utz family. I don't think it's the Utz family that um, uh, made those awesome potato chips that I love, but um, they're probably kin. They're probably related. Um... Hey, just wanted to say thank you to those of you who came to the live screening that I did at the Alamo Draft House in Raleigh. It was great to see your faces again. And it reaffirms the fact that I love showing films to people, including yourself. And I love hearing uh, the responses, um, the groans, the chuckles, the gasps, uh, etc. Um you know, the comments that you guys post give me an idea of what it's like, but it's, it's not 100% the same. Plus, I have to, like, read, so that's hard. Okay, um, we've had a lot of people asking us what the world's like, and um, uh, our round earth. Um, let's find out. Enjoy. What is the Earth like? In a city, it seems like the Earth is covered with concrete. In a suburb, much of the Earth seems to be covered with grass. In the woods, the Earth seems to be covered with trees. Along an ocean, well, you can see that our view of the Earth depends a lot on where we are. The Earth is so big, we see only a small part of it from any one place on the ground. Let's see if we can get a better view of what the Earth is like. From way up high, the horizon, the line where the earth and sky meet, looks straight. It almost seems as though the earth is flat. Yet we know it isn't, because we've seen what the earth looks like from even farther away. The horizon looks slightly curved now. From out in space, we see the earth as a giant ball something like a globe. On a globe, it's easy to see large masses of land and water. From a spaceship, we also see large masses of land and water. Which do you suppose there's more of? Water or land? On a globe, we can tell more easily because there are no clouds to block our view. Much of the Earth is hidden by clouds. Clouds are part of the Earth's atmosphere. Atmosphere. That's what we call the mass of air that surrounds the Earth. It gives off a blue glow in the sunlight. From the Earth, we see it as blue sky. Is the atmosphere important? Would you want to live on a planet without an atmosphere? 
clouds we know are part of the atmosphere, clouds are made up of millions upon millions of tiny droplets of water. When these droplets get big and heavy, they fall as rain. Rain provides water needed by plants. Plants also need gases from the atmosphere. Do people need gases from the atmosphere? What about animals? Do animals breathe gases from the atmosphere? What else does the atmosphere have to do with things on the Earth? The atmosphere acts upon other parts of the Earth, on the land and on the water. Movements in the air cause movements in the water. Much of the Earth's surface is covered by large bodies of water, the oceans. You can probably think of all kinds of animals that live in the ocean. If you've ever swum in ocean water, you know that it's salty. You can feel it in your eyes. Ocean water is called salt water. Do you know what this kind of water is called? Water in a pond or lake is fresh water. This is fresh water too. So is this. Water is not always liquid. When it gets very cold, it freezes, forming ice or snow. Peaks of tall mountains are usually capped with ice and snow. Even ocean water freezes, forming pack ice. But most ocean water stays liquid, even in parts of the Earth where the weather is cold throughout the year. While most of the Earth is covered by water, the part we're more familiar with is dry land. There are more people living on some parts of the land than on others. Many people live and work on this land. Fewer people live on this land. Not many people live on this land. And almost no one lives here. Looking across the surface of the Earth, we get a good idea of what it's like on the outside. What about inside the Earth, below the surface? What does the Earth look like where the surface has been cut away? Miners dig into the earth for materials such as coal and iron. But mostly what they find is rock. Rock that seems to go down as far as they can dig. A volcano can give us a clue as to what it's like even deeper inside the earth. A volcano is formed from lava. Lava is rock. Rock that has become so hot, it flows like a liquid. The rock comes from deep inside the Earth. This gives us an idea of what the inside of the Earth might be like. Scientists believe that if we could cut the Earth open to look, we would find that it's made up of layers, something like this. The outer layer of the Earth, made of the solid rock we have seen, 
is just a few miles thick. It's called the Earth's crust. Below the crust is another layer, which is much thicker, called the mantle. The mantle is believed to be made of heavier rock. Below the mantle is the Earth's core. Scientists think that much of the core may be made up of molten rock, rock so hot that it has melted, something like the lava we saw. But no one has ever seen the inside of the Earth, and scientists do not all agree on exactly what the inside of the Earth is like. They need more information to help them decide. There is much yet to learn, much yet to find out about what the Earth is like below its surface. There is much yet to find out about the large part that's underwater. Many parts of the oceans have yet to be explored. The same goes for the Earth's atmosphere. Men are still exploring and studying the round Earth learning more about what it's like. Earth. Um, this part of the series. There's, there's a couple of the films in that series. Um, back when it was uh, okay to say that the Earth was round, and you wouldn't get a bunch of pushback. Um, anyways, uh, let's see what else we got. We got a lot of stuff here that we can be showing. All right. Um, this is another film that we did from the, uh, we scanned from the Cornet Collection, uh, Growth of Farming in America, 1865 to 1900. So that's post Civil War and um, What's key to that, I think, is the fact that that is post-slavery, um, which changed the dynamic of farming in the South. Enjoy. In 1865, one out of every two working Americans was employed on a farm. Contemporary artists pictured farming as a pleasant, carefree life. But there was a more realistic side to this romanticized view of farming. For instance, in the South, weary Confederate soldiers were returning to land and homes neglected during the years of war and a different economic place on the land had to be found for the former slaves. In the West, farmers brought their families and few belongings to the empty immensity of the Great Plains. Here they built their crude homesteads and brought in their first crops. The realistic picture of farming, almost anywhere in the United States, was that it was a hard way to earn a very modest living. By 1900, only one out of every three working Americans was employed on a farm. There were several reasons for this. Among them were fluctuating farm prices, the rising cost of farming, the shortage of bank credit, and the railroads. Following the Civil War, the railroads had appeared to benefit the farmer. In the East, they had linked the farms with the expanding cities. Here there was a growing urban market for dairy products, fruits, and vegetables that brought profit to the farmer. In the West, the railroads had penetrated the frontier, crossing the Great Plains and hauling wheat from the farms and beef from the ranches to the eastern cities. In the South, cotton and tobacco were valuable cash crops increasingly shipped by rail. So the distribution of farm products to urban markets had been helped by the railroads, but often at great cost. In certain areas, 
shipping rates were high in relation to the market value of the farm products. High rates might also be charged for the use of grain elevators, stock pens, and other railroad storage facilities. Then, too, there were other costs which made farming an expensive business. Prices quoted in mail order catalogs of the time show that the cost of household implements, clothing, and farm equipment was high in some periods in relation to prices for farm products. Since cash was generally scarce, the farmer often bought the store goods he needed on credit. And credit rates for farmers, like those for other small businessmen, were high. So were interest rates on bank loans. To the banker came the farmer, often with hat in hand, to borrow money to buy machinery and to pay his land taxes. Besides coping with such economic pressures, the farmer, despite his hard work, was also at the mercy of the forces of nature. At any time, killing drought, devastating flood, or hordes of insects that he tried to beat out of his fields might destroy his entire investment. On the other hand, when farmers had good crops, they might not be better off. For then, farm products flooded the city markets at home and abroad, and food prices fell. Even so, farmers tended to be optimistic about their future. Many mortgaged their farms to buy more land, more seed, and more equipment to raise larger crops. They hoped that crops, even at lower prices, would bring enough income to pay their debts. But when large crops glutted the market, commodity prices dropped further. For the farmer, it was a vicious economic circle. In Washington, D.C., during the late 19th century, the federal government did little to relieve the economic pressures on the farmer. The Department of Agriculture, part of the executive branch, was unable to solve farm problems by legislation. However, a clerk in the department, Oliver H. Kelly, eventually put the farmer into politics by proposing the Grange, or more formally, the Patrons of Husbandry. This was primarily a social organization for farmers and their families. By 1874, the movement claimed about 750,000 farm family members. Grange meetings took on a more practical aspect as the Grangers organized to pool their resources to cut farming costs. Members were urged to get the benefit of wholesale prices through cooperative buying of their farm supplies and machinery. Several granges did establish and finance cooperative creameries, grain elevators and warehouses, and cooperative banks. In the Middle West especially, the Grange entered politics sponsoring candidates to represent farmers' interest in state legislatures. Such legislators helped pass the so-called Granger Laws of the early 1870s. These attempted to regulate railroad transport rates that often contributed to the high cost of farming. These laws were revoked, however, when the United States Supreme Court declared the Granger Laws unconstitutional in 1886. Unsuccessful in the federal courts, farm legislators also failed to get the federal government to increase the amount of money in circulation. Broadly speaking, the money situation was this. In an effort to lower the high prices and national debt of the post-Civil War years, mints were coining only that money which the government could back with gold. This hard money policy was intended to stabilize prices and costs at lower levels. The money was to be backed by gold. But some farmers wanted more money in circulation, such as the paper greenbacks issued without gold backing during the Civil War, or money based not on gold alone, but also on silver, then coming into larger supply. 
Hopefully, this soft money policy would put more money in circulation and bring rising prices for farm products. Those businessmen and bankers who opposed soft money generally believed that their investments in factories and land, equipment and raw materials would decrease in value if cheap silver money were put into circulation. By 1892, the issue of soft money had become a rallying cry for a new political party, the People's Party, or Populists. Listen to Ignatius Donnelly, a populist leader of Minnesota, talk about governmental money policy. Governmental injustices are breeding two great classes, tramps and millionaires. And to Mary Lease of Kansas. We went to work and plowed and planted. Nature smiled, and we raised the big crop they told us to. And what became of it? Eight cent corn, 10 cent oats, two cent beef. The people are at bay. Let the bloodhounds of money who have dogged us thus far beware. But the populist presidential candidate in 1892, James B. Weaver, was defeated by Democrat Grover Cleveland, a champion of hard money. Next, a severe business depression caused widespread unemployment in industry and a slump in prices. By 1896, even the Democrats were persuaded to champion the cause of soft money at their Chicago Presidential Convention. Among the Nebraska delegates was a staunch supporter of soft money, William Jennings Bryan. Bryan made a speech that posed the money question and the farmer's need for cash as leading issues. They tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that the great cities rest upon our broad and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave our farms, and your cities will spring up again. But destroy our farms, and the grass will grow in the streets of every city in the country. We will answer the demand for our gold standard by saying, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Pandemonium followed the speech, and Bryan was assured the Democratic as well as the populist presidential nomination. After a bitter, hard-fought campaign, Bryan was unable to capture even many parts of the agricultural Middle West. He lost the election to Republican William McKinley, an enthusiast for hard money. The election was followed by a period of prosperity for both agriculture and industry. Between 1890 and 1910, city populations increased by nearly 20 million by 1910, the farm population was actually declining. The city people, meanwhile, created booming markets. Urban dwellers had to be clothed and fed. After 1900, the demand for farm products was growing more rapidly than their supply, and commodity prices rose. Also, industry was producing cheaper manufactured goods for all the population, including farmers. They were benefiting from motor-driven equipment that would help gain higher yields per acre. Scientific methods of farming would be studied at the land-grant colleges established through the Morrill Act of 1862 and agricultural experiment stations, federally subsidized by the Hatch Act of 1887. New methods and machinery and expanding domestic markets would eventually lead to an improved level of living for those Americans who continued to live and work on farms. 
So as the 20th century began, science and technology helped farmers combat many of the earlier hazards and natural limitations on their business enterprise. Commercial fertilizers, improved seeds and breeds, helped increase the yields of crops and animals with lower inputs of farm labor. But despite technological progress and easier conditions of life on farms, economic problems would continue. In particular, the imbalance of supply and demand would affect American farmers for decades to come. That was exciting. Not really. <laughs> um, the the slides show aspect of it was uh, I don't know, not so interesting. But uh, yeah. All right. Um, so here's a film uh, that I have been wanting to show, but it's a longer film. But it's really I love it. It's hip, and it's got some great music, and it's about working. It's about working a job. Here's uh, work. Uh, what's it all about? Enjoy. Work. What's it all about? It's big. It's fun, it's hard, it's easy, it's sweat, it's paychecks, it's working your way up, it's good friends, it's bosses, it's indoors, outdoors, it's recreation, it's a home, a car, it's everywhere, it's everything, it's something different to everyone. Well, it gives me a chance, you understand? to become something and to do something. And this is something that really I desire to do, you know, to become something, to have something that will, as most people would say, you know, to leave to your children. Maybe buy my own clothes, and that's, you have to work to get the money to buy your own clothes, and that's why I went to work. Of many things that are more important than money. Oh, to be sure, it helps to have some money, but uh, happiness is a sort of elusive thing, but a necessary thing if you're going to live a long and fruitful life, I feel like. Well, um, things have to be done in the business world, and someone has to do it, so um, I guess that me, just as good as anyone else, could do it. I don't think enough people now are realizing that things you enjoy doing it's much more fun to make life's work out of it than it is if uh, you've got to say, well, gee, i got to go and I've got to make a dollar, and you don't uh, really enjoy it. You only do it for the money. I think you should pick something, whether it be automobile mechanics or whatever you like to do in your teenage years, and just pursue this individual course of action. I felt that it was just as good as going to college because within four years, well, I'll be considered an electrician, or uh, electrician journeyman, rather, and we'll have my card, you see, and that's just as good. But uh, I think it's probably easier today to make it than it ever has been before. I think as far as work is concerned, uh, you should not get a job only for how much money you can make or uh, just say, or what kind of prestige the job will bring to you. I think uh, for, as far as I'm concerned, whenever I get a job, I'll. I'm looking for uh, sort of a way to fulfill what I think was inside of me. I want to help other people as well. Yes, everybody has his own idea about work. 
but most everybody does work. Those who work do it for their own reasons, and they choose the work that is best for them. Not the easiest task in the world, since we sometimes don't have enough information about what jobs are available to make the best choice. After all, there are over 20,000 different jobs from which to choose. But knowing about a lot of opportunities and the kinds of people who work in these jobs can help in making the best choice. And there are thousands of choices for those who do not plan to receive a baccalaureate degree. The choice for some could be the Allied Health Services. The Allied Health Services is made up of workers in many different roles who are trained in specific areas of the medical sciences. The registered nurse, trained in the science of patient care. Male or female, the registered nurse is fully capable of meeting the demands that go with the responsibility. A licensed practical nurse, another specialist in the area of patient care. The nursing assistant, usually trained on the job where the job is to attend to the individual needs of the patient. It's the Allied Health Services, and it has a wide area of jobs with varying degrees of training. Radiologic technologists, their specialty is X-ray. Modern technology provides a means of detecting disease and injury which aids in the prevention and cure of illness. The inhalation therapist, another member of the Allied Health Services team. Their job is to use, under the direction of the physician, the latest techniques in the treatment of heart lung diseases and any other breathing problem. The surgical technician, they help prepare the operating room and assist the surgeon during the operation. Every person in the Allied Health Services has his own specialized area and his own reason for doing what they do. The laboratory assistant and the certified laboratory assistants work to find the scientific facts needed to diagnose and prevent health problems. The histologic technician who prepares slides from specimens. The cytotechnologist prepares and screens slides for possible cancer cells. The dental assistant, who assists the dentist at chair side. Dental hygienists, who are licensed to remove tartar deposits, accretions, and stains from the teeth. Opticians make the lenses prescribed by optometrists and ophthalmologists. Many roles, many people, all prepared and dedicated to helping others maintain their health. People who care. Each with his own reason for doing what he does. So, what is work? Work is personal, a possession of value and pride. Work. What is it? It's the building trades. A career choice that allows people to build, to be outside, to stay put, or to be on the move. The building trades, which constitutes the largest group of skilled workers in the nation's labor force, employed in a wide range of jobs, from small home remodeling and repair, to building great skyscrapers and bridges. It's bricklayers who build walls, partitions, chimneys, and other structures from brick and masonry. Carpenters, the largest group of building trades workers, are employed in almost every type of construction activity. Electricians who usually serve an apprenticeship, lay out, assemble, install, and test electrical fixtures, apparatus, and wiring used in electrical systems. Heavy equipment operators operate the various types of power-driven equipment, such as cranes, bulldozers, trench diggers, or any of the heavy equipment in the construction industry.
painters. Apply paint, varnish, enamel, lacquer, and similar materials to surfaces. Paper hangers. Cover room interiors with paper, vinyls, fabrics, and other materials. Plasterers. Apply a plaster coating to interior walls and ceilings, and also apply cement plaster or stucco to exterior walls. Plumbers and pipe fitters. Assemble, install, alter, and repair pipes and pipe systems. And they install plumbing fixtures, appliances, and heating refrigeration units. Sheet metal workers. Fabricate and install ducts for ventilating, heating, and air conditioning systems. They also fabricate and install other sheet metal products, such as roofing and siding, storefronts, and metal framework for neon signs. Soft floor covering installers. Install, repair, and replace resilient tile, linoleum, vinyl sheet goods, as well as carpeting. Structural steel workers. Correct the steel framework of buildings, bridges, and other structures made of steel. All builders, constructors. But man, what opportunity, what decisions. Decisions that affect the rest of your life. Confusion, confusion, confusion. It can leave you in a daze. But there's nearly always confusion in the decision-making process where many choices are possible. Work. What is it? Often the hardest part is deciding what kind for you. Look into all the angles. Explore all the possibilities, all in terms of you. What you like. Work. What is it? It's manufacturing, where hundreds of thousands of men and women find careers in such diverse tasks as refining ores and petroleum, to spinning and weaving textiles, and providing the thousands of products needed for personal and national benefit. Work. People. People in industry, assemblers, floor assemblers, putting together large heavy machinery or equipment. Bench assemblers, putting together small parts or making sub-assemblers. Chemical engineering technologists, comparatively new on the industrial scene, working with chemical engineers to make materials that are stronger, purer, more attractive, and more versatile. Control room operators, controlling chemical processing equipment. Dye cleaners, cleaning used dyes, inspecting, correcting, reassembling, and storing dyes for future use. Draw twist operators, operators of the machine that draws and twists yarns from a spinning pattern. Electrical engineering technologists, working with utility companies in engineering sales and as technicians in consulting offices. Industrial maintenance electricians, maintaining a variety of electrical equipment. Industrial electronic engineering technologists, maintaining industrial electronic devices. Industrial draftsmen, taking the specifications and rough sketches of engineers and designers and translating them into working plans. General industrial maintenance men, setting up and repairing mechanical equipment. Industrial Mechanical Engineering Technologists, helping to create and utilize mechanical power, concerned with interchanging electrical and mechanical power. Chemical Testers, working with chemicals in the lab, testing, analyzing, and reporting findings. Physical Testers, testing continuous filament yarn, style, yarn, or tow, using instruments and machines. Industrial welders, plan and layout work from drawings and blueprints. Work, it takes planning. Knowing what you want to do is only part of the process. Planning how to get there is also a very important part of getting that job. Planning means knowing what you want and working out the details to get it. Special planning or special jobs. Office and business occupations where you will find a variety of work opportunities, maybe for you. Bookkeepers, keeping daily records of financial transactions. Cashiers, 
receiving payments made by customers for services or goods. Office machine operators, helping to speed up the paperwork of modern business. Stenographers, taking dictation and transcribing their notes. Secretaries, doing stenographic work and handling a variety of business and office details. Typists, being fast and accurate. Receptionists. Greeting customers in person, on the telephone, making appointments, giving information. Data processing operators, operating the various kinds of mechanical equipment required with the electronic computer. Telephone operators, assisting callers, providing information, keeping records, making necessary mechanical corrections. Shipping and receiving clerks. They usually do the clerical work necessary to keep track of goods transferred from one place to another. Computer programmers. Carefully analyze data to be processed in a computer. Then exact and logical steps can be worked out to achieve the desired information or solutions. School. Vocational education. Training. Technical education. Apprenticeship. Correspondence. Preparation. Learning. It's all part of work. Learning to read and write. Learning arithmetic. Learning to walk. Learning science. Learning special skills. Learning to get along with others. Learning dependability. Learning for a purpose. Learning how to do something. It's all work. And it's all there for any individual choice that you make. From on-the-job training to college education, there's a place to get the preparation you decide you need. It's work. It's transportation. Transportation that moves passengers and goods over highways, railways, airways, and seaways. Truck drivers over the road, long distance driving, or truck drivers in town making city deliveries. Bus drivers driving between cities. driving over city and suburban streets. Aircraft mechanics, inspecting, making minor and major repairs on aircraft. Airline dispatchers, coordinating flight schedules within a specific area. Air traffic controllers, giving instructions and information to pilots. Teletypists and radio operators, transmitting messages concerning weather and flight information. Traffic agents, ramp agent, load agent, gate agent, tickets, baggage, cargo, loading, unloading, planning, coordinating, transportation. Railroading. Brakeman, seeing that the proper signals are displayed, checking air brake equipment, assisting the conductor. The conductor, coordinating much of the work of the train crew and the engine crew. The engineer, the man who controls the huge and powerful locomotive. Transportation, moving, shipping, freight, cargo, longshoremen, ports, tug crews, commerce, shipping company personnel. Transportation, connecting, interchanging, moving the goods and people. Work, it's transportation. Work, it's sales. Sales, where thousands and thousands of men and women work toward the distribution of goods and services. Workers, selling in stores. Handling money, ordering, stocking shelves and racks, preparing displays. Automobile salesmen, selling cars. Automobile parts countermen, selling parts and accessories. Wholesale salesmen, 
representing a company that assembles and distributes products to retailers and industrial and commercial firms. Route men, selling and delivering goods. Route men, retail, wholesale. Selling, insurance, real estate, door to door, by appointment, selling. By telephone, traveling, selling, a big work arena. Work. What is it? It's a lot of things, but mostly it's individual effort. Effort channeled into constructive and rewarding directions. Work is people doing what they do best because they like what they do, and they like what it can do for them. Individual effort, genuine and earnest, builds, produces, and creates. It's called work. Work with a personal touch. It's personal services. Personal services provided to aid in the protection of our lives and property and furnish the services which help make life more enjoyable and comfortable. Workers who serve the public with their skill and derive many personal and material satisfactions from their careers. Firefighters. Called upon to handle many different kinds of firefighting jobs. Fire prevention. Always alert and ready. Policemen and police women. Preventing crimes. Investigating. Traffic duty, meter duty, patrolling, apprehending, protecting. Cooks and chefs, preparing food. It's a chain of events. Specialists, short order service, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Waiters and waitresses, taking orders. Good service makes going out a treat. Personal services is hairstyles. Wigs, barbers, cutting hair, treatments, hair and scalp, massages, shaves, shampoos, and the hairpiece. Cosmetologists, giving permanence, style, set, color, straighten, anything for the hair. Personal services, work that brings results. It's communications, where men and women provide the essential skills necessary to improve and enhance the communications of our world through telephone, the printed word, radio, and TV. The communicators, producers, workers, Cable repairmen, repair, route, and maintain the cable flat. Cable splicers, splice cables, cut in and rearrange terminals, and cable pairs and terminal cables that control offices and branches. Frame men. Telephone installers, telephone repairmen, Private branch exchange installers. Linemen, placing wires and cables. Operators, assisting callers in completing calls. Switchmen, engaged in the maintenance and operation of central office equipment. Test deskmen, test boardmen. Checking, preventing breakdowns. Testing, locating and analyzing. Repairing. Communications, radio, television, broadcast technicians set up, operate, and maintain the electronic equipment used to record or transmit radio and TV programs. Radio and television programming. Building sets, technicians. Announcers, communication. Commercial artists create artwork designed to capture attention. Photographers are artistic and technical specialists. Composing room specialists, setting type manually by perforating tapes, trial proofs, proofreaders, photo engraving. Photo engravers make metal printing plates of illustrations and other copy that cannot be set in type. Electrotypers and stereotypers make duplicate press plates of metal, rubber, and plastic for letterpress printing. 
primarily in book and magazine production. Printing Pressmen. Prepare type forms and press plates for final printing and tend the presses during operation. Lithographic occupations include cameramen, artists, strippers, or plate makers. Book binders. Fold, sew, staple, and bind all kinds of publications. How do you get there? It takes a decision. Sometimes, many decisions. Work is more than decisions. It's also planning, school, effort, and results. It's people making a living, doing what they like to do, and making money at it. It's skilled services. Skilled services where workers install, control, maintain, and repair the complex equipment needed in today's homes, offices, and factories. They maintain and repair automobiles, airplanes, and household appliances. Appliance servicemen. Air conditioning, refrigeration and heating mechanics. Automobile body repairmen are metal craftsmen, repairing damaged automobile and truck bodies. Automotive technicians. They do preventable maintenance, diagnose breakdowns and make repairs. Business machine servicemen repair and maintain typewriters, calculators, cash registers, electronic computers, all kinds of machines. Diesel technicians maintain and repair diesel engines and diesel powered equipment. Farm equipment mechanics. Service technicians, work, rewards. They're yours to use in your own way, in your own time. Money to spend to do the things you like to do because work is also time off, evenings, days, weekends, weeks. Work is all of this. And work is the machine occupations. The machine occupations where workers control machines specifically designed to make the desired shapes from metal. Careers for all round machinists. An accomplished metal worker who can set up and operate most types of machine tools. Instrument makers. They work closely with engineers and scientists in translating ideas into models, special lab equipment, and custom made instruments. Layout men. Mark metal casting forgings or metal stock to show where and how much machining is needed. Machine tool operators shape metal to precise dimensions using machine tools. Setup men set up machines and prepare machines to be used by other operators. The tool and die makers are the specialists of the machining occupations. They specialize in producing jigs and fixtures. Tool and die makers also make precision measuring devices used in manufacturing. Some tool and die makers also help design tools and dies. Counselors or people, adults, parents, all are asking what you want to be. Well, it got to the point where I didn't know in the first place. It's called work. Results for those who do the work. The results? Being able to support yourself and a family. Being able to buy and have the things that you want and need. To work. To have earned your independence. To become self-sufficient. The results are much like the work. It's up to you. You choose your work. And you choose the results. It's sometimes hard, demanding, and frustrating. But if you really like it, it's worth it. Worth it because you have learned and earned your way. You're an individual, independent and capable. It's doing your job. It's a good feeling. It's work. Yep, it's big, it's complicated, it's decision making, it's planning, it's training, it's effort, it's results, it's rewards. It's what nearly everyone does. And if you plan to work, you want to know yourself and you want to know the opportunity. You want to make a good match. 
What's it all about? It's about your life. Why not explore, uh, I uh, finally, I forgot what it was, rewarding careers. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, Joe, so what we need you to do is we're going to give you this, this three-page list of all these different uh, jobs, and then you just read them, and, and you'd be excited about each one that you're reading. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty great. I mean... It's long, and certainly we have other films that kind of refre reflect um, this uh, this type of strategy, which is, get, hey, young people, let's get excited. You're graduating from high school, or you just got out of the military. Like, hey, here's some jobs to consider. What are you interested in? Let's go for it. Woo! Um, you know. And the music made it help and, and all that. So, very exciting. Uh, how successful was it? I don't know. But the one thing I do know is that um, SCE TV uh, also made Ro Rivas, which is a, a great film that uh, we have shown in the past, uh, which is about uh, the importance of using the out of doors. Uh, not using the outdoors as a bathroom um, because of parasites. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the, uh, the money to help us buy some coffee or some artist tape or some, uh, I don't know, a variety of different things. Um, if you like what you saw, you could certainly hit the thumbs up or the like and subscribe. Uh, but you could also do like Kevin did and use the super thanks option uh, to donate. And you can also go to ko-fi.com slash avgeeks or patreon.com slash avgeeks. Those are also great ways to support us. But even just being there and commenting, noting that I occasionally dance during songs, all that stuff. Thanks so much. We'll be back tomorrow. Everybody take care. <laughs>